Well, hello and welcome to church today. Uh, it's obviously um, an unfortunate circumstance that we find ourselves in where we have to do church online uh, with the lockdown being extended as well. I can imagine there's many heavy hearts out there. Uh, but we do have fantastic news uh, that we can still meet together and worship our God who is the same yesterday, today and forever. Um, so what a fantastic hope to have. Uh, you might also have realised that Brian uh, is not well. Uh, that was in the Friday update. Uh, so we've got a little bit more of an update since Friday. He's back at home uh, resting and recovering and in the future we'll go see some more specialists to figure out um, what's going on. So that's good news. Uh, I'm Frank and welcome to St John's Asquith uh, Church Online for today. Today we've got uh, a number of things going on uh, and because Brian's unwell, Tim is going to be preaching to us uh, but not in the Leviticus series. So we've added in an extra sermon um, and the Leviticus series will resume in the future uh, next week, God willing. And uh, for today, Tim is going to preach on the secret lives of Christians, uh, and that's from uh, Matthew's Gospel, uh, part of the Sermon on the Mount. So I hope you're looking forward to that. We've got lots of other things on as well, some stuff for the kids, uh, some stuff for the adults. We're going to be praying together, singing together um, in your own living rooms, not here, and doing all the things we'd normally do in church. So how about I pray for us to begin with? Uh, Father, please calm our hearts, uh, allow us to focus on you um, as we look uh, to understand who you are and how we should live our lives in response to that. Uh, and Father, I pray that you would take away the busyness of our lives and the chaos that is around us uh, and give us minds and hearts that can focus on your message here today. Amen. Let's pray together the prayer of thanksgiving and it's going to come up on the screen. So together, Almighty God, Creator and Redeemer, we praise you for your work of creation, for the beauty of the world around us, and for every gift that we enjoy. We bless you for creating us to know you, love you, and obey you. Most of all, we thank you for your amazing love in sending your Son to restore your world, to die for us, and to give us life in all its fullness. Accept, O God, our praise and thanksgiving through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Well, we have two things in our kids' spot today. First of all, ooh, excuse me. First of all, we've got a song, uh, and that's a really fun song, and you'll see that. And then we're going to roll straight into a video. Now, this video is uh, from Crew, a place I work. Uh, and a friend of mine, Kelly, has done the first talk of a series of five talks in Five Wow Promises from Romans. We're not going to watch all those five talks here at church, but later on today, I'll send out a link so that if that's something that's helpful for you in your household, um, you might want to sit down with your kids and watch them. They're designed for upper primary, but I had a watch of this one, and I think that it is uh, nice and clear, so it would work for some people who are younger. And as adults, I think it's actually a fantastic reminder of the key truths of the gospel as well. So if that's interesting to you, uh, resources and videos, keep an eye out for your emails and I'll send that through later today. So let's see the two videos. Hey Sarah, we're looking pretty cool today. Do you know what's even cooler? What? One, two, three, four. <laughs> Yeah. 
everyone. Welcome to this series where we'll be looking at one of the most amazing chapters in the Bible, Romans 8. And through this series, we're going to see five wow promises that God makes to all of us. Let's start with the first wow promise. I want you to imagine that you are sitting in the back seat of a car driven by one of your parents. Maybe it's your mum, and you're on your way to school and you all know that the school bell is just about to ring. And because you're running late, your mum is driving a little bit faster than what she should. Just then, your mum's phone rings and she picks it up and she answers it. And as soon as she says the words, hello, you hear this. It's the police. Their sirens are blaring, their lights are flashing and they want your mum to pull over. And so your mum pulls over and with fear on her face, she winds down her window. The policeman walks up to the window and he says to her, Ma'am, we know that you were speeding and we saw you on your phone. And are you wearing a seatbelt? Your mum looks down and she realises that in the busyness of trying to get everyone into the car, that she forgot to put her seatbelt on. Your mum has broken not one, not two, but three road rules. They're going to take her licence away for sure. The policeman looks at your mum and says, Ma'am, can I please see your licence? And, and you're sitting in the back seat knowing that she's in a lot of trouble. Like she's going to be punished big time. And as your mum hands over her licence, she says to the police officer, Sir, look, I'm really sorry. I promise I will never speed or do any of these things ever again. Can you please let me off? You're in the back seat, and even though you don't drive, you're like, there's no way he's going to let her off. She's broken the law. She has to be punished. And the policeman, when he looks at your mum's license and he looks back at your mum, and with a really kind face, he says to her, okay, I'm going to let you off this one time. Please don't ever do it again. And as he walks back to the car, your mum turns and looks at you and says, wow, what a kind and merciful police officer. Would this happen in real life? No way. If you break the law, then you'll be punished. If you are guilty, then you must pay the penalty. A good policeman wouldn't let you get away with breaking the law. But surprisingly, in the passage that we're going to look at today, it tells us that God will not punish us for breaking his laws. Let's have a look. If you belong to Christ Jesus, you won't be punished. The Holy Spirit will give you life that comes from Christ Jesus and will set you free from sin and death. Wow, what a great promise. Because of Jesus, we won't be punished. But why? When we've all done the wrong thing. Up until this point in Romans, the message is clear. Everybody has sinned. You, I, everyone, we've all done the wrong thing. We're all sinners. We've all broken God's law. We all deserve to be punished and we all deserve to be cut off from God. Let me explain what God has done in Jesus so that we can be saved from the punishment that we deserve. Our passage says that sin traps us and that we need to be set free from it. Because we've broken God's laws, we all deserve to be punished. And being punished is being separated from God. So because of sin, we are separated from God. Because of sin, we can no longer be friends with God. We're on one side and God is on the other side. Now, lots of people think that, well, if I just do some really, really, really good things, that God will overlook my sin, that I can be friends with God. Or if I go to church every Sunday, or if I go to my crew group every week and just be super, super good, well, that will mean that I can be friends with God again. But that's not how it is. What does it say in verse three? It says that God set us free when he sent his own son to be like us sinners and to be a sacrifice for our sin. God used Christ's body to condemn sin. God sent Jesus into the world and unlike us, Jesus never sinned. He wasn't trapped by sin. He was the one person in the whole wide world who didn't deserve to be punished. And when he was nailed to the cross, he died in our place. He was condemned instead of me and instead of you. When someone trusts in Jesus, we are set free from the punishment of sin. And it means that we can be friends with God again. We are no longer facing the punishment that we deserve. In fact, we are now friends with God. God is very merciful to us. He treats us in a way that we don't deserve. 
If you trust Jesus, you can be friends with God. And it's important to remember this wow promise. In life, even though we are friends with God, we still sometimes sin. I know I still do the wrong thing, and sadly, I do it often. I often feel guilty, and I think that God must be angry with me. But I now have nothing to fear, because God has forgiven me. Because of Jesus, I won't be punished. God doesn't hold anything bad against me. Never will I face God's punishment. Because of this promise, I know that God loves me and he treats me as if I am innocent, even though I am not. Wow, this is the best promise ever. Let's thank God right now for this amazing wow promise. Please join with me as I pray. Dear God, thank you for this amazing wow promise. Thank you that we won't be punished as we deserve because of Jesus. Thank you that Jesus takes the punishment for us. Help us to always remember this amazing promise. Amen. Fantastic. My mum definitely, well, maybe my mum would have got caught doing the wrong thing every now and then. Hi, mum, if you're watching. Uh, a few weeks ago when I did the kids spot, I realised as I was preparing it that we don't often say the St John's Mission Prayer when uh, the kids are in big church. Uh, so I thought it might be worth as we finish the kind of kids church chunk of our time together that we all say the St John's Mission Prayer together now uh, just so you guys can see it and hear it one more time. And remember, we've got four of our mission partners um, and the prayer points for them are still accurate and true. We'd love you to keep praying for them uh, as we consider the people that we send to proclaim Christ. So the words are kind of come up on the screen and we're going to pray our St. John's Mission Prayer together. Lord, make us a people who love people so they may see Christ, reach people so they may know Christ, equip people so they may serve Christ, and send people so they may proclaim Christ. All to your glory. Amen. Joe is going to bring us the first Bible reading. Good morning, everybody. I'm going to read for you Galatians. Chapter 3, verses 19 to 26. Why then was the law given? It was added for the sake of transgressions until the seed to whom the promise was made would come. The law was put into effect through angels by means of a mediator. Now a mediator is not just for one person alone, but God is one. Is the law therefore contrary to God's promises? Absolutely not. For if the law had been granted with the ability to give life, then righteousness would certainly be on the basis of the law. But the scripture imprisoned everything under sin's power so that the promise might be given on the basis of faith in Jesus Christ to those who believe. Before this faith came, we were confined under the law, imprisoned until the coming faith was revealed. The law then was our guardian until Christ so that we could be justified by faith. But since that faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian, for through faith you are all sons of God in Christ Jesus. What fantastic news! Um, we're now going to sing, well, we're not singing in here, but you can sing at home, a fantastic hymn, and it's called What a Friend We Have in Jesus. Recently, after Bible study, uh, where we looked at prayer, uh, one of the group members um, in my Bible study group, shout out Richard Thompson, texted us through um, in our Bible study chat, saying this was his favourite hymn. Uh, and I thought that that's a fantastic encouragement. Um, and one of the sad realities is that without meeting in person, Probably one of the best ways to connect and maintain connection and encourage each other is through things like chat groups um, or if um, you're in different sorts of phone clubs or phone call groups or whatever it is. 
uh, can I take this as a, a way to encourage you uh, to keep encouraging each other uh, by sharing things that you find helpful in your faith uh, because that, that can prompt us and encourage us to keep loving one another. Uh, so this hymn is a fantastic reminder that we can take all our concerns uh, and cast them at the feet of Jesus. So let's sing together. sins and griefs to After that encouragement, let's pray together in the words that the Lord taught us to pray. Um, and that's also going to be in our Bible reading that's coming up. The Lord's Prayer together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sit against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Now, Aaron's prepared a book review for us on a book called... Oh, you probably can't read that out. It's called A Brief Theology of Periods. Yes, really, is the title. And it's... In line with the topic uh, that we've been working through in Leviticus, uh, so this was mentioned in Brian's sermon last week, um, and Aaron's going to unpack the book a little bit more for us. Uh, it's still available for purchase, so if you want to, you can jump online and buy it off Kurong or something like that, or get in touch with the office because we had a few copies from the recent Equip conference as well. Hi, everyone. This is a book review of Rachel Jones's book, A Brief Theology of Periods. 
I promise to be brief. This book explores womanhood, time, pain and purpose. Um, the key theme of this book is how the female reproductive system points to God's good design. Rachel Jones tackles the physical aspects of periods throughout this book, um, breaking them down into various chapters. Things such as pain, mess, hormones and reproduction are topics that she explores throughout the book. Through those topics, Rachel weaves various Bible passages um, and a message about how the physical experience points us to our creator and how it's all part of his design and his purpose for us as women. I love how Rachel describes the female body in this book. She describes it as a timepiece, a timepiece shifting within us from one cycle to the next, month to month, but also from one season of life to another, from girlhood to womanhood. I found that a nice reminder of how temporary life is here on earth and how we should be focused on eternity and not necessarily the day-to-day, -day, the mundane or the pain that life on an everyday basis brings. Um, this book is full of encouragement. I personally found it encouraging. Um, Rachel weaves humour throughout the book, but not in an insensitive way for various people who might be experiencing another level um, of pain or difficulty with the female reproductive system. The encouragement that Rachel talks about in the book is that nothing is beyond God's comprehension. Nothing is too big for him. Um, and we are created in his image. And that is something to celebrate. There's a lovely reminder in this book as well um, from Hebrews chapter 9, verse 22, that the law requires that nearly everything be cleansed with blood. And without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. Um, that is a timely message given we are exploring Leviticus at the moment as a church. There is also um, a section of the book dedicated to Leviticus chapter 15. Um, I won't go through that. I found it quite helpful. Um, and it's interesting the way Rachel explores that. Um, she talks about it in terms of how she digests the passage um, and what kind of questions she has for herself after reading it. Um, there's also a section in the back of the book dedicated to seven big questions uh, regarding periods, starting from the Garden of Eden and going all the way through to um, real life struggles. So I highly commend this book. Um, it's not very big. It won't take you very long to read and it's quite helpful. I thoroughly enjoyed it. Good morning again. I'm going to read for you our second reading from the book of Matthew. That's chapter 6, verses 1 to 18. Be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others to be seen by them. Otherwise, you have no reward with your Father in heaven. So whenever you give to the poor, don't sound a trumpet before you, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets, to be applauded by people. Truly, I tell you, they have their reward. But when you give to the poor, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret, and your Father, who sees in secret, will reward you. Whenever you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites, because they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by people. Truly, I tell you, they have their reward. But when you pray, go into your private room, Shut your door and pray to your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. When you pray, don't babble like the Gentiles, since they imagine they'll be heard for their many words. Don't be like them, because your Father knows the things you need before you ask him. Therefore, you should pray like this. 
Our Father in heaven, your name be honoured as holy. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And do not bring us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For if you forgive others their offences, your heavenly Father will forgive you as well. But if you don't forgive others, your Father will not forgive your offences. Whenever you fast, don't be gloomy like the hypocrites, for they disfigure their faces so that their fasting is obvious to people. Truly I tell you, they have their reward. But when you fast, put oil on your head and wash your face, so that your fasting isn't obvious to others, but to your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. Flee at once, all is discovered. Uh, Mark Twain once sent such a telegram to a dozen of his friends and apparently uh, they all left the country. Uh, Well, good morning, friends. My name is Tim and today we are talking about secrets. In particular, uh, the secret nature of our holiness, which when we've been making our way through the book of Leviticus, I think, is quite an important conversation. Uh, We are taking a detour from our series, uh, but I think uh, this passage in Matthew is quite helpful. See, in Leviticus, our holiness often seems very skin deep. Touch this, uh, you're unclean and not holy. Have a skin disorder, you're not clean, you're, you're not holy. The priest had to wear certain clothes, Uh, And and very specific, visible acts had to be carried out in the view of sort of all the people, or at least in public, uh, in order for anyone to be declared holy. Uh, We've also spilt much ink in trying to convey that message uh, of to be holy is to be set apart and distinct from the world. Uh, How it's about the way in which we mirror God's character, his unique goodness, in how we conduct our lives. So still very visible, very outward. So what do we do when the Bible then teaches us in Matthew 6 that our holiness is to be practiced in secret? That our reward has already been paid in full when we practice our faith before others because our reward is their approval rather than that pleasing aroma to the Lord that we saw in Leviticus 1. Because we know that second reward, that pleasing of God, is the only one of eternal significance. Well, let's pray, and then I'm pretty sure we can work this out together. Loving Father, we thank you for your word. Thank you that you call us to, sorry, that to call us uh, Christians is not a hollow term, uh, but that we have a relationship with you. Help us to hear your words in Matthew today and respond accordingly. Amen. Now, I want you to uh, want to ask if you can grab your Bibles, make sure uh, you are open to that passage we read from Matthew 6. If that means you need to pause and grab a Bible quickly, do what you have to do. Uh, But I'll reread just the first verse to begin with. Be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others to be seen by them. Otherwise, you have no reward with your Father in heaven. Now, the headline seems pretty unambiguous here. Beware, practicing your righteousness for the approval of other people is linked to the loss of reward from God in heaven. Now, is this just a sensationalist overstatement by Jesus? Not at all. Here's what he's saying. Firstly, Jesus cares about the secrecy of the Christian life. Uh, The idea of not putting the acts of our Christianity, your holiness, so to speak, on display for all to see. Now, I realize there's a great irony in me standing here saying this in a sermon from the front. 
on display for all to see, more so than ever as we're online. But of course, your holiness will be seen. After all, it informs how we relate to others. But the key phrase is this in verse 1. To be seen. Don't practice your righteousness to be seen. Right? It, it's not don't let your righteousness be seen, but don't be righteous for the sake of being seen. If God is really the only one you're concerned with them seeing your holiness, ask yourself this. Is your holiness only visible when others can see it? When you're at church or small group or youth group, the only relevant audience for your holiness, whether you're with others or not, is God. That's not to say that how others see us is not important. Uh, We're still meant to be beacons of God's character in this world. But the only one we need to be seen by to receive their pleasure is our Father in heaven, who sees even what is done in secret. So when you're in a situation, when you have a chance to display holiness, well, first of all, do it. But second of all, who are you thinking of? God or the people around you? Now, I personally know how hard that can be uh, when you're doing something at church, for example. Uh, Of course, you're aware that the people around you will make judgments about you based on it. Uh, it's, It's just naturally what people do. And so you start thinking along the lines of, well, I have to say this or or do this so people don't judge me in a negative way. And then in your singing, your prayer or whatever you do, the attention shifts from pleasing God and seeking his approval to recognition from others. Why do you think? We don't clap after the sermon or or, or the music. It's because hopefully the people who serve in those ways aren't doing it for your praise. There almost needs to be a secrecy that is something below the surface when it comes to our service of God. In that our actions aren't just this public display for others to see. Uh, It's kind of like uh, as if Christian lives were a tree. Uh, Anyone can see a tree uh, as long as they've got eyes that work uh, and the fruit that it bears. But sustaining that tree is this great big system of roots. And the roots are hidden underground. But at the same time, they're the life force of that tree. And without them, the tree is not only just good for nothing, the tree dies. External holiness is not enough. If you only look holy at church, the tree is dead because it has nothing under the surface. If you are only holy at church, are you really holy? In fact, you want to know what Jesus says about this sort of Uh, external only holiness Uh, well in Matthew 23 verse 27 he says to the Pharisees you are like whitewashed tombs which appear beautiful on the outside but inside are full of bones of the dead and every every kind of impurity or in other translations as resonates with Leviticus uncleanness In the same way, on the outside you seem righteous to people, but inside you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. External holiness is not enough. We need holy hearts, so to speak. I mean, these were the guys who most people in society saw as the super religious, the super godly. Are we simply this pretty exterior of holiness or do we have the same holiness in private as we do in public under underneath all the exterior as we do in terms of what's visible now 
That's where we get to the question of reward. What will the reward of your holiness be? And in one, one way, it's a bit like a, an arcade. You know, when you go to time zone or something like that, you play all the games, you can win some tickets, and then you cash in your tickets for a reward. Well, what will the reward of your holiness be? There's two options. If you do your acts for the praise of others, Jesus says you've received your reward. Approval from others, that's your reward. But look at what else Jesus says. All through the passage, we see the command of secrecy and it's coupled with the promise of reward from God. Give in secret and God will reward you. Pray in secret and God will reward you. Fast in secret and guess what? God will reward you. Because when something is done for God and God alone, our devotion is pleasing to him. And being in God's pleasure and all the goodness that we enjoy in that pleasure is the reward. What a waste to be holy for the sake of approval from others. What a well-spent life to be holy for the sake of the approval of our Father in heaven. And the question you have to ask yourself is this. Which reward do you want more? So Jesus has these uh, three points, uh, three ways in how we uh, might express our holiness and the reward for it. And uh, to kind of flesh it out, to help us understand what this might look like in our lives, he gives us uh, three examples of of people or or things we can do uh, that might not be the best way to express holiness. Uh, The first, in verse 2, is the person who gives but does so in the limelight. And uh, don't get me wrong, uh, the people of God should be generous. The people of God should give. Uh, We as a church only survive off uh, generosity uh, expressed as a sort of response to God's goodness. And and so much uh, beyond our church only exists because of that too. But here in uh, verse 2, this person uh, gives not so much to help the poor or to aid the work of the church, but more so to show people how generous they are. They give to others. They make sure everyone knows about it too. You know, this is a person who who loves to tell their friends about all the marvellous things they're doing or or post about it on social media. Uh, Let me give you a scenario. A lady decides that she wants to help out the homeless people of Sydney. Fantastic. Uh, Now, in her generosity, she takes a whole year's pay and donates it to a shelter at, at a huge cost to herself, right? This is not a small thing. And to be honest, that's an awesome thing to do. Then she gets them to put up a plaque about her generous donation so that everyone can see. Uh, she tells all her friends and family how generous she is. Uh, she does a, a tell-all interview with a, a picture of her and a giant check to show how much she gave Uh, up for for others well don't get me wrong i'm glad this hypothetical lady and it is a hypothetical uh, gave up her money to help the needy but let's be clear she has received her reward in full in seeking and receiving the praise of others now look at verses three and four jesus says when you give Don't even let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. That is to say, don't just avoid being uh, holy and generous for the sight of others, for the approval of others, but don't even seek your own approval and satisfaction. I do it only for the reward of God. Our second example from Jesus is prayer in verse 5. When you pray, Jesus says, go into your room and shut the door. See, we're to act in contrast with uh, those for whom their motivation for prayer is to be seen. They have received their reward, but you will have your reward for secrecy. 
from God the Father. Now, the passage talks about praying on the street to be seen. I don't think we're uh, really in a society where, where we're likely to fall into that trap. Um, we may fall for the trap of praying like that in church, though. It's pretty easy to forget that you're talking to God because you're so focused on saying the, the right things for everyone to hear. And if it's not about what others think, are you then also praying in secret? Do you talk, uh, spend time talking to God when you're not at church or with friends or even with family? Uh, if you care about prayer, it's not going to be this thing that only happens when others see it. When you pray, it doesn't matter what anyone thinks but God. Do you think God is impressed by big words or eloquent speech? Right? He invented language. He knows our needs before we ever pray for them. And I think our efforts to look impressive simply look like that of an arrogant child. Prayer is how we talk to God, not how we show others our holiness. Unless, like a prayer leader at church, you need to be in public why not pray in secret? And when you do pray in public, pray just like you do on your own. Now, the third illustration that Jesus uses is fasting. Uh, fasting, you might say, that, that doesn't uh, seem to be a, a common part of my experience as a Christian. Uh, certainly, we're never commanded to fast in the New Testament. But we can actually still value the act of fasting and the idea behind it, uh, which is to humble yourself before God in repentance. So if you fast, by all means, it is a helpful thing to do uh, to humble yourself before God. But take a look at verse 16. Jesus doesn't want us to know, uh, sorry, to let others know if we do fast. Whenever you fast, he says, don't be gloomy like the hypocrites, for they disfigure their faces so that their fasting is obvious to people. Now, in that case, it's not about humbling yourself before God. It's exalting yourself before your peers. You know, they walk around looking miserable, you know, looking pain. So everyone knows just how, how devoted they are to God, how pious they are in their suffering uh, well they get their recognition everyone sees them and the image that they want to present of themselves but that is their reward they have no reward from god for this because they're not doing it to please him but themselves or others now on the other hand the one who fasts in secret the one who shows up looking normal uh, presentable and doesn't tell anyone well the only person they're doing it for is God and this is what pleases him so Jesus has these three illustrations giving prayer and fasting and he's making the point that our service of God doesn't exist to make us look good or it's not serving God but ourselves and that God will not reward this sort of self-serving behavior. I mean, we can give and pray and even fast secretly, but in the end, these are just some examples. The real test is, can we live our whole lives as secret service to God? Do we need recognition from others for any of the various ministries that we get involved in? Or do we seek the reward of God's approval alone? Now, I want to briefly say something about the Lord's Prayer, and uh, it's fantastic that we got to pray it earlier in our service, uh, because that, that, that is part of what Jesus has to say here. See, right in, this, right in the middle of this discussion about uh, secrecy and reward, Jesus tells his disciples how to pray. Pray like this, he says, and he teaches them the Lord's Prayer. Now, read it over. Uh, because I'm not going to say much about this prayer, other than it is Jesus showing us how prayer should be, which is that it's focused on God alone. 
I see this prayer is entirely about God and his purposes. See, even when it shifts to being about us, it's still in light of God's purposes. Notice also, this is a prayer that Jesus prayed, but there's no impressive language. There's no lesson in theology as he prays. Just completely no frills and sincere. So what's the implication of all of this for us? Well, I want to start by saying the secrecy of your Christian life is a sign of your belief in eternity with God and his reward. If you trust that there is something more than this world and the affirmation received in it, you should seek the approval of our eternal God and live for him not only publicly but secretly. Also, I think that we need to try and make our secret acts of Christianity, our, our secret under, under the surface holiness, the normal expression of our belief in God. And let the things people do end up seeing just being an overflowing, an extension of what we do in private already. Our public acts of Christianity cannot be the be-all and end-all for us. This is precisely the sort of religion that Jesus tears down, where everything is done for appearances. It's like being an actor for an audience. But the moment you leave the stage, in this case, the presence of others, the mask slips off and you're a completely different person. We also need to consider the reward of God. I want to encourage you. I know that there are people in this congregation who do so many wonderful things with no intention of ever being seen for it, whether they are or not. I want to remind you that you have God in heaven who sees everything, even what is done in secret, and will reward you for it. There is nothing more worthwhile you can do with your time than to please God. And at the same time, we fail. I can tell you that every single time I read through this passage, I am struck sort of with horror about how much I care about the approval of others. I want to push you just a little bit harder each time you read this, each time you come in contact with this, to repent of this along with me. But I also want to encourage you to look at the example of Jesus. Jesus, although God was also human and like us, was tempted in this very same way. Tempted to seek the approval of others, not God. In Matthew 4, we see it. Satan takes him up a mountain, shows him all the kingdoms of the world and says to Jesus that he will give them to him if he just falls down and worships Satan. Now, Jesus could, at this point, have disobeyed his father and sought his own glory, but he didn't. He could have had all the praise in the world and of the world, and yet he sought his, approval, his father's approval instead. His answer was, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him alone shall you serve. We're not in the business of being worshipped for our holiness, but worshipping God for his. And as we serve God, we need to keep imitating Jesus. We need to keep our focus solely on God, not on other people's praise or on ourselves. And as we keep trying, albeit imperfectly, God will change us and make us more like Jesus. So remember this, be holy to please God alone, whose approval is a far, far greater reward than any other we might find. Amen.
Well, thank you very much for that, Tim. Um, how about we just uh, spend a little bit of time reflecting on uh, what Tim's just shared with us there. Um, so maybe you just take a little bit of time to think through and pray about things uh, that you need to be aware of in your Christian life um, and uh, start that process of repentance that Tim shared with us. And we all know um, that we all sin and fall short of God's glory. Uh, but the fantastic news is that God still loves us and cares for us. And he hears uh, when we come to him um, as broken people who are acknowledging our need for his saving. Uh, part of the thing we do at church every week is we uh, share in a public confession together. Um, so I'd encourage you to join in with us now. And in exactly the same way that Tim was sharing before, uh, we do this uh, for our relationship with God, um, not because we want to please other people or impress other people, uh, but we also acknowledge that this, as we do it together, is an encouragement uh, that we are all acknowledging before one another uh, that we fall short of God's glory. So let's pray this prayer of confession together. I'll say the white words and you follow with the yellow words. Lord, we have come to see that our lives fall far short of your glory. Have mercy and forgive us. Lord, you have given your life for us and poured out your spirit, yet we fail to return your love with all our heart. Have mercy and change us. Too often we are selfish and proud, ignoring you, Lord, and neglecting others. Have mercy and cleanse us. Lord, when we do not truly trust and obey you, we are overwhelmed by self-pity, fear and worry. Have mercy and deliver us. In Christ, we are given a sure hope and secure love, yet we follow the false hopes and desires of this world. Have mercy and forgive us. Father, through the redeeming death of your Son on the cross, by your Spirit and through your Word, transform and renew us to follow you with joy. All this we ask, confident in your unchanging faithfulness. Amen. Well, Fiona is going to lead us in a general prayers now. Hi, St John's. As we pray this morning, I'll include some words for Afghanistan that were written by the people behind the Pastor's, Pastor's Heart podcast. Join with me now as we pray to our holy God. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? You, God, are our refuge and strength and ever-present help in trouble. Therefore, I will not fear. Though the earth give way, though an army besiege me, my heart will not fear. Though war break out against me, even then I will be confident. Our Heavenly Father, when we watch the news at the moment, fear seems to be the natural response, even for us in this sheltered part of the world. I cannot imagine how our brothers and sisters in Afghanistan could feel anything but fear right now. Yet, Lord, you call us to trust your goodwill and be confident in your power. This peace is a gift from you the peace that comes from your Holy Spirit in us. Father God, we ask for your Holy Spirit to pour down on everyone in and affected by what's happening in Afghanistan. With this increasing news of deaths and violence, we ask you to quickly bring peace and stability to that nation. We especially pray for the women who are now fearing for their lives and fearing for what living under the Taliban will mean for them. We pray for comfort for those grieving the deaths of family members <clears throat> in the bloodshed so far. 
We pray for the Christians there, that they might be safe and be able to show great kindness to others, and that through their actions people might turn to Christ. And Father, we thank you for the many in the armed forces who have sacrificed so massively for the people of Afghanistan over the years. Please bring them comfort and hope, and we ask that in some way you will build on the progress that they made. We pray for wisdom for political leaders here and abroad, that they might make decisions to care for the vulnerable and oppressed and to promote justice and righteousness. We also continue to pray for your mighty hand to wipe out COVID-19 from the face of the earth. We know you are stronger than any of these forces and pray that you would act in unmistakable ways to still this disease. <clears throat> Please sustain our leaders with wisdom, unity and courage and bless their efforts to restore peace to our city and our world. At this time of our sustained lockdown, we especially pray for your comfort on people who are lonely or isolated, people struggling with lost income or purpose, with mental or physical troubles. In fact, Lord, we pray for all of us as we ride the joys and trials of life, all coloured by lockdown. Lord God, please heal where healing is needed and bring your peace to every heart. Help us at St John's to connect with each other, to uphold one another in prayer and help and support each other in meaningful ways. <clears throat> we pray now for Brian Heath. Thank you for the care he has received and we ask that you continue to guide Brian and his doctors and restore him to full health. We thank you for the many ways that Brian upholds us at St John's and ask for your help to keep things running as he recovers. We also ask that you uphold our link missionaries who devote their lives to reaching people for you. Keep them safe from COVID and help them to speak and act so that many will come to know of your love for them and that your spirit will work to change their lives for good. Today, I particularly think of the Langmeads in Lightning Ridge and pray that you will keep the virus out of this highly vulnerable town. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. Well, friends, uh, we have a few notices, a few things going on in the life of our church uh, to let you know about. Even though we're in lockdown, uh, there's still stuff uh, happening, which is great. Uh, the first is, uh, as we know, it's quite often to, uh, quite hard uh, to imitate our God, even though we know we should, uh, and especially in the area of forgiveness. Uh, so perhaps you've been thinking about this uh, topic or in hearing this announcement, you kind of go, oh, well, maybe I should think about this topic a bit more. Uh, more College is uh, live streaming an event. Uh, the details can be found. You can either Google it uh, or if you want, uh, have a look in the Friday update. Uh, there is the bulletin and I think there's a bit more uh, in there about this event uh, or worst case scenario, get in touch with the office, uh, find out some details. Uh, it's an online live streamed event uh, and yeah it's on the 25th of august so coming up quite soon um, so if you would like to be part of that uh, jump online and uh, yeah hopefully it is helpful in your thoughts on the matter uh, i also just want to pass on uh, an update and, and brian's uh, well a message from brian uh, as frank already uh, let us know brian is now home uh, he had a blood clot in his leg uh, and uh, the doctors uh, at the hospital uh, were happy to send him home. Uh, so he's uh, recovering, but he wants you to know uh, that he is very grateful for your prayers and your support uh, as, he, as he does so. He'll be back in action uh, tomorrow, he tells me. Uh, so I'll give him a large sack of work to do uh, to make up for today. Uh, but no, Brian is at home actually joining us for church just like you uh, watching online. Uh, so please do keep praying for him. Uh, pray for the Heaths as he recovers. Um, also uh, coming up this Thursday, 
uh, we have a, a short seminar uh, workshop on mental health. Uh, lockdown is something that is really quite uh, impactful uh, in all sorts of ways. And one way is our mental health. Uh, so we wanted to take a bit of time as a church uh, to sort of talk about how we can look after our mental health in this time uh, with a view to, to biblical material, uh, as well as thinking about uh, some of the sort of psychological uh, implications of what's going on here and, and ways forward. Uh, so we'll, we'll gather together on Zoom uh, at 7.30 on, on Thursday night. Uh, there will be an email sent out to all our uh, church members uh, who are uh, regularly receiving emails um, so if you're not part of a list where you're getting emails from our church uh, just reach out to the office you can find the email on our website uh, and say hey i'd like to know a little bit about that um, but we hope we can see you then um, and the zoom link will be sent out tomorrow with some more details and then finally uh we want to stay in contact uh, as a church and we realize that you might be watching uh, church online and thinking, oh, you know, I'm, I'm here at home. Uh, how do I get involved in what's going on at church? Uh, well, we're very happy to have you involved. We can have uh, people either come in and serve or send in videos. Uh, so if you would like to do that, please do reach out and let us know. Uh, we'd be happy to uh, have you part of what we're doing here. Uh, we just had a, a, a video of uh, Fiona leading us in prayers. Uh, that's a great example of one way that you could do that. Uh, but speaking of sending in videos and, and watching videos, uh, we are going to watch an interview with Jenny Clark, who is our uh, office administrator. Uh, she's being interviewed by Brian uh, outside of our church uh, about the signboard. Uh, now, You'll notice there is quite a lot of background noise, cars going past, even honking at one point, uh, people walking past and chatting. Uh, and yeah, it makes it a little bit harder to hear the audio at points. But what an awesome reminder uh, that our church is on a busy thoroughfare with plenty of activity in life, even when we're locked down. Uh, so uh, as you watch it, we want you to consider whether you are able to support uh, the vision of uh, having a new signboard there, one that engages with our community and makes the most of that opportunity. Uh, the it's part of our centenary projects, which you might be going, well, has a centenary passed? Are we still sort of raising money for these things? What's going on there? Uh, for now, we're, we're saying, look, uh, if people are happy to give to these projects, uh, we're happy to let them give uh, and we'll see uh, where we go from there, um, how, how we go in terms of raising the funds. But thank you for all of your generosity so far. Uh, it's been quite overwhelming to see uh, the response in that matter. Uh, and just a reminder, uh, budget updates for our general offer tree uh, are contained in the weekly bulletin. Uh, you'll see if you have a look there that we are starting to fall behind. Uh, so uh, we'd love if you can prayerfully consider if you are able to keep giving uh, to our general offertory or increase your giving, uh, even if you're in a position to do so. Uh, and if you're at home going, I'd usually put money in a box in the church, uh, it might be a good time to investigate how you might do that online or give Jenny in the office a call and figure out a time to drop that off. Uh, but let's watch this video uh, and we'll find out more about our sign. Hi everyone, my name is Brian Heath. I'm the Senior Minister at St John's Asquith. And I'm here at St John's uh, at the front yard in front of our signboard. I'm here with uh, Jenny Clark, our Office Administrator. Uh, welcome Jenny. Thank you. Now, uh, you know this uh, signboard um, through and through. Well, you have a bit of a love-hate relationship with it. I do, um, How yes. long has that relationship been going on? <laughs> um, well, the signboard came in 2005 when it was a new shiny thing that worked all the time. Um, over the years it started to deteriorate and uh, it's a bit sad because it's on this side particularly held up with sticky tape and glue um, just so the letters don't fall off but sometimes they still do. Yes, yeah, so it's uh, in a state of disrepair. It is. Uh, needs replacing. 
Yep. Um, part of our centenary Thanksgiving projects uh, is to get a new electronic signboard. Yes. Uh, you've done the research. Yep. Uh, tell us what the new board can do. Uh, the new board is an electronic digital board. Um, it'll be about almost the same size as this but it has the features of being able to, to have rotating um, different messages on it. We can put pictures and logos and it's going to be able to be updated instantly rather than having to wait for someone to come and change the letters and spend an hour or so trying to fix it up. And we won't have to fight with letters falling off. <laughs> Fantastic. Now the day that we get this new signboard, God willing, how yes. will that make you feel? I will be very happy and I'll be very relieved because <laughs> I guess it'll add to the stress because then we've got to think of what we're going to put on it. But it will be a real improvement on what we've got here now. And it improves at two levels. One, uh, new branding at the top. Yes. Uh, with, that's obviously dated and I can see that's coming off as well. Yep. <laughs> um, and the bottom part electronic so we can project much better. Yes. Uh, as you can hear and see, uh, much uh, passing traffic and uh, especially right. on school days. Yep. Um, so if people are considering giving uh, to this project, what would your advice be to them? I think it's a, a great project because it's going to be something that will last for a long time, we hope, and it will improve our profile, it'll help people to see that we're modern and up to date and that we're trying to communicate with our community. Um, and I just think it's going to be wor really worthwhile. Fantastic. Thanks, Jenny. Thank you. All right, and we've got two slides. So uh, these will come up and they'll probably be pretty evident in the context of what we're talking about. Uh, the first is the letters having fallen off the signboard. Uh, you can also see the old branding there. And the second is the proposed new signboard. Uh, so we have been talking about this uh, for a number of years at Parish Council. I remember it was first floated over five years ago and we've got a fantastic opportunity to see this project through. Uh, we've got plans to put in a DA uh, so that we can do this uh, when the funds are fully in. So we definitely have the ball rolling on this. Um, and from the Friday update, um, if you check in the bulletin, you can see the figures, uh, but we're just shy of $80,000, uh, which is an amazing contribution that people have made to these projects. Uh, so can I encourage you, if you haven't done so already, to consider that. Uh, and for those who've already donated, uh, a big thank you. It's obvious uh, that there are lots of things that need our attention around the church. Um, and these things we have designed to bring a specific benefit to the church uh, and to have an outreach focus so we can grow God's kingdom. We're going to sing again uh, the song, See Him Coming. So uh, let's sing. Once 
Uh, well, I hope that you found today a challenge and an encouragement. Um, and as I was uh, going through the service, I noted down a few things um, where people had said, oh, maybe you could think about this or I commend this to you. So let me uh, remind you of what those were. Erin uh, commended the book uh, she reviewed to you. Um, and it strikes me that a lot of us probably have good Christian books, if not that one, uh, that are sitting around at home that could do with a bit of reading. Um, we have uh, as two Zoom events coming up this week uh, on Wednesday and Thursday nights, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, we've been uh, given the invitation for people to come and volunteer in the services, either by sending in videos or uh, coming in person. Um, I'm going to share the kids spot videos so you might be able to do that as a family. There's a whole bunch of things to think about. Um, and my hope and prayer is that all of those can root you in your faith and secure you um, to build up your faith and your holiness, not so that other people will see and notice, uh, but so that your relationship with God is strengthened uh, and improved um, because we know that these spiritual disciplines and others uh, will give us um, a deeper faith and a deeper assurance of God's love so that we can trust him in these challenging and tough times. So how about I pray for us as we finish up? And then I'll see you digitally sometime in the future. Dear Lord, I pray to thank you so much for the opportunity we have today uh, to look at your word and to understand your call on our lives. I pray that as we uh, give, as we pray, and as we humble ourselves before you in fasting or other things, Lord, that we will be aware of just how big you are um, and aware of just how much you love us and how much you have done for us. And Lord, I pray that as we do these things, you would develop in us a holiness that is not for the display um, so that other people would see, uh, but is for our relationship with you uh, to put us in the correct standing before you. And we pray this in your name. Amen.